Hello friends, welcome back. So this video lecture will talk about the disorders of the high serum potassium which is hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is defined when serum potassium level is greater than 5.5 milligrams per liter. Again you got to rule out pseudo hyperkalemia whenever you are seeing a clinical case of hyperkalemia. So that could be because of sampling. For example, when the blood is being drawn, there could be forearm contraction too much leading to hemolysis, fist clenching or too much tight tourniquet. Um, any sort of increase in the cell count with again lysis can give rise to hyperkalemia like thrombocytosis, leukocytosis, erythrocytosis. Uh, sometimes there could be a possible contamination of the potassium containing EDTA. And then you have there is something called a su seasonal pseudo hyperkalemia or pseudo hyperkalemia. And this is again, if you remember my previous lecture on hypokalemia, I told if you increase the ambient temperature of the collected blood sample, then you are increasing the uptake of the potassium by the cells, you lead to hypokalemia. If you decrease too much of the temperature, then it leads to release of the potassium from the cells and cell death, leading to hyperkalemia. Um, excess, so let's talk about what are the different things that leads to increase in the potassium. The same way as we discuss the hypokalemia, we will discuss the hyperkalemia. So one is release from the cells. So what, are the, what is the main store for the potassium? It's the muscle. So rhabdomyolysis can give rise to RBCs have it. So myositis transfusions can give rise to it. Tumor lysis syndrome where there is just lot of cells being killed, leukocytes being killed. So these leads to what? Hyperkalemia. What about the redistribution and hyperkalemia? So as you remember, if you remember my physiology lecture, then you will remember these things. Hypertonic mannitol or hypertonic saline by increasing the osmolarity. IV dye contrast again by increasing the osmolarity. Amicar, which is a cation induces efflux of the potassium. This is used very commonly in post-op cardiac patients, um, cardiac surgery patients to control the bleeding. Exercise through the differential um, activity of the catecholamines uh, on the receptors. Fasting in ESRD patients due to the lack of the release, insulin release, digoxin, then beta blockers as well. Uh, there is something called as familial hyperkalemic periodic paralysis as well. It's a primary myopathy um, and there is a weakness due to hyperkalemia. Um, increased potassium intake or of rest after exercise is known to precipitate this. Myotonia is the known feature of this disorder. Um, there is a tetrodotoxin sensitive sodium channel mutation in this disease. Uh, persistent mild depolarization due to invert sodium current leads to what is known as increase in the tone. And the tone is not enough to carry out a action, but it again leads to increase in the tone with myotonia, but not enough to generate a powerful this one, so you become weak. When the action potential is at around 20 to 30 millivolts, all other sodium channels are inactivated and that's why there is myotonia with weakness. What about reduced renal excretion of the potassium? So if you remember the excretion of the potassium from the ROMK channels is mediated by the aldosterone. So anything which has to do with aldosterone can lead to decrease in the urinary potassium excretion. So reduced aldosterone secretion by the adrenals. It is reduced response of the aldosterone by the kidneys. So there is aldosterone resistance. There is a reduced distal sodium and water delivery as occurs in hypotension or volume depletion. And if you remember for the ROMK channels to act, you need the distal nephron to present with sodium which is absorbed by the ENAC channels. ENAC channels will create the potential gradient and that leads to opening of the ROMK channels and that will secrete your potassium. And hence, you know, you need if you deliver less sodium by reducing the GFR as with hypotension, volume depletion, you will do that. Acute or chronic kidney injury um, can also give rise to these things. And so these are some of the causes here for reduced aldosterone production um, and aldosterone resistance. Uh, aldosterone production could be reduced in, for example, hyporenemic hypoaldosteronism, for example, renal disease, NSAIDs, calcineurin inhibitors, volume expanded states like in GN, ACE inhibitors can give rise to this one, ARBs, um, um, that is uh, angiotensin receptor blockers and direct renin inhibitors. Um, chronic hyperinemia can also do this by impairing the aldosterone synthesis, primary adrenal indeficiency, insufficiency, um, severe illness, inherited disorders like congenital hypoaldosteronism and pseudo hypoaldosteronism. We'll talk about this. Then you have aldosterone resistance as with um, potassium, sperm, diuretic, spinalactone, epilirinone, amiloride, 
triamatrine, antibiotics, trimethoprim and pentamidine, pseudo hypoaldosteronism type 1, and then Olti's defects um, because of the less sodium delivered to the distal nephron. Uh, so hypoaldosteronism, it could be primary um, hyperaldosteronism, um, which can be either genetic or acquired. Genetic like AHC, that is adrenal hypoplasia congenita, lipoid congenital adrenal hypoplasia, 21 um, hydroxylase deficiency, then isolated hypoaldosteronisms. What are the causes for acquired? In developed countries, the most common is autoimmune diseases. In developing countries, um, I believe it's tuberculosis, but needs to be confirmed. Uh, then you have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, renal amyloidosis, HIV, tuberculosis, and then CMV adrenalitis. What about hyporenemic hypoaldosteronism? This is kind of like a secondary hypoaldosteronism, which could be because of the diabetes, old age, chronic kidney disease, especially stage 4 and onwards, lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus, multiple myeloma, acute GN, and then you have plasma expansion leading to ANP secretion. What about pseudo hypoaldosteronism, meaning that the serum levels of the aldosterone are normal, but they are behaving like as if they are hypoaldosterone. So it has type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is again because of the loss of the function mutation of the mineral cortical receptors. Type 2 is called as Gordon syndrome. There is a gain of function mutation of the sodium chloride channels which are located in the distal nephron. And these are the same channels which are acted upon by thysar diuretics. So, in in Barter, sorry, in Gittleman syndrome, if you remember, it was the blocking of the sodium chloride channels, which leads to all different manifestations. So, if you reverse it, you will get what is known as gain of function mutation, and that becomes the Gordon's syndrome. What is that? Also known as familial hyperkalemic hypertension. So, if you have a gain of function mutation of the sodium chloride channel, so you are absorbing all the sodium. So, if you absorb all the sodium in the distal nephron using the sodium chloride channels, so you are increasing the volume, so you become hypertensive. Now, if you become hypertensive, what would happen to the aldosterone synthesis? It will go down. If it goes down, what will happen to the potassium secretion? It will go down as well because you remember ROMK channels are mediated by potassium, uh, sorry, aldosterone. So, hence they become hyperkalemic and there is also less release of the protons because sodium is already absorbed through sodium chloride channels. There is uh, no sodium available for the epithelial sodium channels to take it and hence there is no exchange of the potassium or the protons leads to metabolic acidosis. This will lead to a hyporenemic hypoaldosteronism due to volume expansion. Okay, what about the medication induced hyperkalemia? So, you have cyclooxygenase inhibitors which reduce your GFR and hence distal sodium delivery. They also do prostaglandins which activates the maxi K plus channels and hence prostaglandin synthesis blockage would lead to deactivation of the maxi K channels and hyperkalemia. Hyporenemic hypoaldosteronism is also one of the mechanism and the last one is there is a reduced response of the adrenals to the hyperkalemia because one of the stimulus for the aldosterone release is potassium. Okay. What are the other medications? You have cyclosporin and tacrolimus used very commonly in transplant patients and some of the um, other disorders uh, and that is through the Wink pathway. Um, Bactrim, amyloride, Bactrim is um, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Uh, then amyloride, triamtrin, pentamidine, which blocks the epithelial sodium channels. You have ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and direct renin inhibitors and causing hyperkalemia. So remember, NSAIDs, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, trimethoprim, sulfamethazole, amyloride, triamtrin, pentamidine, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and direct renin inhibitors are the common cause for hyperkalemia. There are various other medications, but I did not list them here. So a quick approach. I know it's a very busy slide, um, should be, the bottom line is when you have uh, high serum potassium, always rule out pseudo hyperkalemias. Once you rule out pseudo hyperkalemia, then you go into detail and look for any medications causing it. And if not, then if you have suspicion for pseudo hypokalemia, sorry, uh, if you have suspicion for aldosterone mediation, you check urinary potassium excretion along with TTKG which is transtubular potassium gradient and that would help you to know if kidney is under excreting that's why the serum potassium is high or kidney is appropriately responding it and based on that you can further proceed and then try to come to a diagnosis. 
how do you manage a case of hyperkalemia so one thing you should remember there are three ways there are three things to approach hyperkalemia one is acutely to take out the effects of the hyperkalemia on the cardiac myocytes which is to antagonize the effects of the this one and that's really important because a serum potassium of eight and nine can be fatal and patient can die like this because of the fatal arrhythmias so that's one thing you have to do second thing is you have to rapidly remove the potassium from the blood and move into the cells and that is a redistribution you do and third one is you have to permanently get rid of the potassium from the body so that you don't get the rebound hyperkalemia so what are the uh, so how do you do the antagonism of the cardiac effects of hyperkalemia so what you do is you try to what happens is there is you raise the action potential threshold to a less negative value without changing the resting membrane potential so that you create a bigger difference between the resting membrane potential and the threshold action potential to activate the action uh, um, a response so what do you do, how do you do that is by giving calcium chloride and calcium gluconate and calcium chloride should be technically given through a central line because a peripheral vein extravasation can lead to necrosis and this is you got to be very careful whereas calcium gluconate can be given through a peripheral vein effect will start immediately in one to three minutes and last for about 30 to 60 minutes you use calcium gluconate whenever you see ekg changes from hyperkalemia which is typically after six or 6.5 how can you do the redistribution of the potassium into the cells? One thing you remember is by giving insulin with glucose. Uh, if someone is hyperglycemic, then you don't have to use glucose, just use insulin. So only IV form of insulin, which is the regular insulin, you give around 10 units along with an, uh, 50 mLs of 50% dextrose. Effect will start in 10 to 15 minutes, peaks by 30 to 60 minutes and will last for another 4 to 6 hours. So you keep repeating every 4 hours if the serum potassium goes back up. Um, that's number one. Number two is beta agonists. Beta agonists are um, also known to push potassium into the cells. Uh, this is one of the techniques used when you don't have a peripheral access in the emergency room and uh, you want to treat the hyperkalemia immediately. Uh, this is one of the techniques that they use. It's not very effective though. The role of sodium bicarbonate is controversial in patients with um, hyperkalemia. Um, and this is the study which was published in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, talking about uh, looking at the different treatment aspects for uh, hyperkalemia and as you see uh, dialysis the most effective insulin with glucose effective epinephrine to some extent effective but bicarbonate was not uh, but the reason why you use your bicarbonate is acidosis can make shifts in the potassium and hence with that understanding if someone is acidotic you just use the bicarbonate as well um, how about removal of the potassium and this is the this is the must um, so you can give diuretic for someone who is making urine uh, you can use mineral corticoids but this is not helpful in acute situations this is more in chronic hyperkalemia for example type 4 renal tubular acidosis um, and then you have cation exchange resins which is um, SPS exchange sodium and uh, which is the sodium polystyrene it exchanges sodium with the potassium in the colon and hence gets rid of the potassium and then if these things don't work then you have the dialysis hemodialysis preferably than the peritoneal dialysis in acute situations like this um, on average three to five hours of hemodialysis session removes approximately 40 to 120 milligrams of the serum potassium so when you are managing a case of hyperkalemia remember if there are any ekg changes give them calcium chloride or calcium gluconate and then you go to the redistribution of the potassium into the cells by giving insulin, dextrose, sodium bicarbonate and maybe beta 2 agonists and then you have to think about removal of potassium in all the cases by either giving diuretics, cation exchange resins and then dialysis. There is a new cation, there is a new um, um, agent that was just um, FDA approved called as pituramer which also acts uh, through a, a different mechanism and gets rid of the serum potassium. Um, you should always advise your patients about the foods which are high in potassium which includes um, these are the foods uh, dried figs molasses and seaweeds are very high um, and then you know the other foods as you see you should always advise your patients to stay away from the foods which are high in potassium especially in chronic kidney disease patients who are prone to develop hyperkalemia thank you please subscribe to our channel on YouTube all or none law